So let's jump into covering some of the principles for evaluating risk of bias. And again, this is within the context of going from bits of evidence and articles to actually changing patient practice. So I think the first principle that we have to have down is that there are different levels of evaluation. And what we're doing is, again, evaluating the degree to which evidence is trustworthy or not, and it's not a single step. So let's look at those. First, we have to talk about the internal validity of an article, and we do this by evaluating particular risk of bias questions, often called signaling questions. These signaling questions help us to guide us to make a broader decision about the risk of bias within particular risk of bias domains. Then we have to think about external validity. And here we move to talking about the overall confidence in the conclusions that we can have across studies uh, that provide the body of evidence. And finally, there's the notion of practice utility. What is the strength of recommendations that would guide uh, clinical practice? So in this little segment here, I'm only going to focus on internal validity and just give you a broad overview of this. I will provide you some resources for uh, establishing or evaluating external validity, that is to say the overall confidence that we can have in the conclusions once we've pulled all the pieces of evidence together. So the first thing we, I want to do is clear up a potential misconception. Quality versus risk of bias. Now, article quality is not the same as risk of bias. People often confuse the notion of an article's quality, is it a good or useful article, with risk of bias. Now, the notion of quality is a global, subjective assessment that doesn't tell you what particular aspects of the study pose threats to the confidence that we can have in the findings of the study. And we want to avoid, you know, subjective, mushy assessments. Risk of bias assessments are much more specific. That is to say, they focus on discrete characteristics of the study and they have much clearer criteria. So when evaluating a study for, systematic, uh, for a systematic review and meta-analysis, we want to focus on risk of bias. Well, what is bias? Let's assume that it's been a while since you took a methods course. Bias is systematic deviation of results or inference from the truth. So it's not the same as imprecision. Imprecision is random deviation from the true measure of the finding. For example, if I were to do the same study multiple times on different samples, I would find slightly different results in each one of the samples. Some of the measures would be higher, some lower, and that's just due to random variation in when I do the study, who I carry out this stu uh, study on, etc., etc. Um, that's imprecision, that's not bias. When we're talking about bias, I find these little sort of figures to be helpful. Bias is a problem because we can have a very precise measures that systematically lie to us. So if you look over here, this is unbiased and precise. We got all of our sort of, think of it as all of our shots within the bullseye, all right? Here, and they're very close together, so that means they're precise. Here we have very precise measures, but you see there's a systematic, it's systematically off-center, off the truth. So, in precision we can deal with statistically, and it's always present to some degree. But notice how the measurement points are all spread out. Again, that's imprecise, but for instance in this case, even though the measure is imprecise, at least all the points surround the true measure and point us in the right direction. So what we are talking about is bias, something that shifts us away from the truth in a systematic way. How do we identify bias? What we need are tools that can help us identify study characteristics that can lead to bias. And what's nice is there has been a ton of research over the past decade or so to identify what specific study characteristics are associated with bias. So we don't have to guess. We're not making anything up here. Concretely, 
What we mean by this is studies that have a particular characteristic tend to systematically overestimate or maybe underestimate the true effect size. So, an example. Randomized control trials that are not blinded also tend to have higher effect sizes or larger effect sizes than RCTs that are blinded. This gives us a pretty clear sense that failure to blind is associated with systematic overestimation of the effect. What are some general tool components? Well, in general, tools will target a specific set of domains associated with risk of bias. They will seek to estimate bias in each domain by asking a series of questions. With good tools, you'll often see a few questions for each domain. Well, how do these tools work? Well, first, think of these as each being different domains of validity, selection bias, detection bias, etc. And so what will happen, a tool will typically include several questions for each domain. We call these signaling questions. And what by answering the signaling questions, this can lead you to a transparent and principled decision about whether risk of bias is present in a particular domain. So here's an example from AHRQ that shows how signaling questions are embedded within domains. You see on the left there, these are the different risk of bias domains. And within each of these domains, there are a set of criteria or que signaling questions that we would answer to finally come to make a decision about whether or not selection bias or performance or attrition or detection, etc., was present in the study that we were looking at. Now, different study designs are susceptible to different sorts of bias. The specific domains differ based on study design, so tools to evaluate randomized controlled trials are going to be different than those that are used for cohort studies, diagnostic accuracy studies, um, studies of exposure, etc., etc. In this lecture, I'm going to focus on a particular tool that is often used to assess clinical trials. But as I said, there are others for other types of research design. So for your project, you'll want to find one that's appropriate to the question and the study design. Now, what's nice about the ARC approach is that they clearly indicate which questions are appropriate for different kinds of research designs. So notice that not every question is relevant for every design. What are some principles of good tools? Well, ARC advocates using the following general principles when selecting a tool or approach to assessing risk of bias in systematic reviews. So the tool should be specifically designed for use in a systematic review. It should have demonstrated acceptable validity and reliability. Um, that is to say the tool itself has been researched, not just used in research. It should specifically address items related to risk of bias, internal validity, and that preferably are based on empirical evidence. Where available, it should be specific to study designs being evaluated. And it avoids the presentation of risk of bias as a composite score. Um, that is, you know, an overall numeric rating of study risk of bias across items. For example, 11 out of 15 items. Notably, an example of one of the kinds of risk of bias tools that have been used within physical therapy literature is the Pedro score. Um, actually, I would warn you against that. That's not a good approach. So what do you use? Well, even narrowing down to tools that meet the previous criteria, there are a lot of options. With so many options, how do you choose? Well, for this lecture, I'm going to show you the most commonly used tool for clinical trials that has research support and is designed specifically to be used in systematic review and meta-analysis. So, for diagnostic, or for here are the common tools. Um, for treatment or intervention questions, you have um, the Cochrane Risk of Bias tool. Now, I'm going to show you a previous version of that, the Cochrane Risk of Bias 1.0. That was developed uh, earlier on simply because I think for when you're learning, it's a simpler entree into what is actually a pretty complicated field of assessment of risk of bias.
when you have questions with only observational study designs, there's the Newcastle Ottawa scale. Um, there are also some um, other tools that are available, recent ones that have come out. Um, but again, I'm a, for a new, you know, if you're new to this, then something like the Newcastle Ottawa scale may help you with, say, cohort designs, etc. And for diagnostic accuracy questions, there's the Quadus II. So let's talk about overall confidence versus risk of bias. Once we have all the risk of bias questions answered for a particular study, we still haven't made a determination of the overall confidence that we can have that that study is telling us something we can trust. Now, that might not make sense, so let me unpackage that. Think about it. We have to ask confidence in what? Studies usually have several outcomes they measure. They design them to study primary outcomes. Sometimes this means that the secondary outcomes aren't always as carefully measured. For example, I worked on a project where nutrition outcomes in relation to exercise were our main uh, interest. When we examined exercise-focused articles, they did an amazing job of measuring these exercise outcomes. But their measurement of nutrition outcomes mm, really lacked rigor. So even in a study that has a cross domain as a low risk of bias, it may be woefully inadequate from the perspective of your particular outcome of interest. So in general, if there are many risk of bias issues in an article, we can have we just have low confidence in its findings. If there are few risk of bias issues, then the confidence that we have depends on the specific outcome. So what are some key components of a risk of bias tool? Well, there's the questions, like I said, or sometimes called criteria or signaling questions. The domains, and these are the general types or categories of bias, and you saw that earlier in the ARC tool. Then there's overall confidence in uh, what the study is telling us about our outcome, our primary outcome of interest, and that is often listed as high, moderate, or low. So, for instance, on the Quadus II, under the domain for patient selection, there are three signaling questions, okay, and answering these questions help you assess the risk of, ba uh, risk of bias domain uh, or risk of bias for the patient selection domain. Now, I want to make clear there is a difference between risk of bias and writing guidelines. Don't confuse the two. Standards for uh, standards of reporting for articles tell authors what components of the study should be reported. Risk of bias tools help you evaluate whether there are problems in the study design or execution that increase our confidence. And so here's just some examples. So for instance, there is a starred reporting standard, but the risk of bias tool is Quadus. Uh, there's the consort for randomized controlled trials, and there we have the Cochrane risk of bias. And they even have both writing guidelines and risk of bias tools for systematic reviews. So let's sum this up. Risk of bias is not the same thing as quality. We evaluate risk of bias by domain using a series of questions to help us make a decision. We use design-specific tools to evaluate the risk of bias.